Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today Show. And today, as promised, our topic is on hypothyroidism. That means basically an underactive thyroid. Now, when your thyroid is underactive, all these symptoms down here occur, but first I want to review through what the causes of under or hypothyroidism or underactive thyroid are. Iodine deficiencies. <sighs> iodine used to be found really heavily in our iodized table salt, but now all the docs and everybody else are saying to limit the salt. So with the limitation of salt, we're ending up oftentimes with an iodine deficiency. Or we're ending up with things that block iodine uptake. And that would include chlorine in our water, fluoride in our water, fluoride found in pesticides and chemicals. Those halogens on the periodic table, and remember that from high school, um, block the uptake or the receptors for iodine. So you can end up actually with a hyper or hypothyroid um, problem. Very important to recognize that if you're nutritionally deficient in iodine, also in other areas as well too, and hopefully I'll list it on here, vitamin E. Huh. If you're vitamin E deficient, 95% of your iodine will not absorb. 95%. So if you're vitamin E deficient, which the majority of Americans are, good luck on iodine uptake. Vitamin A, selenium, zinc, copper, magnesium, B6, all of these found in a good multiple vitamin, a good multiple vitamin that absorbs, not one from your local grocery store or outlet center. We need a good multiple vitamin that are rich in absorbable forms of these types of nutrients. Autoimmune disease, Hashimoto's disease, which is becoming more and more common, whereby the body's own immune system attacks the thyroid and disables it, or disables its ability to convert thyroid hormone 3, thyroid hormone 4. It can also cause as well little tumors on the thyroid to grow. In other words, the body starts eating away at its own thyroid and it isn't going to function right. We're seeing more and more Hashimoto's. We don't know particularly why other than potentially the nutritional deficiencies, the iodine, as well as the other nutrients, as well as potential for radiation exposure from all those dental x-rays. I had one dentist that wanted me put me through each individual tooth. I have 28 of them left, x-rays. And I said, out of here, ain't going to do it. I don't care how much protection you put over here and make sure when you get your x-rays to do that, your thyroid is exposed to radiation and multiple exposures can lend itself to problems with the thyroid. Um, progesterone deficiency or estrogen dominance. What happens is, is when you're estrogen dominant, it will go in and it will actually block the thyroid receptors. So a lot of women who are very overweight, who are on birth control pills, who are on Primarin or those types of estrogen replacement therapies, they're going to block their thyroid receptors and I'll be doggone, most of my customers that come in on hormone replacement, they grow. Because obviously one of the side effects of an underactive thyroid is weight gain. My perimenopausal women, I'm seeing a lot of estrogen dominance and then as we go through in our 40s and 50s, the decrease in progesterone levels Progesterone helps thyroid uptake. So when the progesterone levels fall, I'll be doggone, your thyroid isn't going to function or convert T4 into T3 as readily. So those doctors who say when your uterus is removed, don't worry about progesterone, they're wrong. You need progesterone for more than just your uterus and to cycle. You need it also for thyroid support. Um, stress cortisol. Cortisol, adrenaline, suppresses um, thyroid as well. So if you have high stress, well, if you're a working mom and you have a couple of kids, you're in high stress. That excessive amount of stress hormones, oftentimes we see you gain in weight again, will actually slow the thyroid. These doctors who put their patients on these really low calorie, um, and they use the, the um, ventramine to help speed up you know, the ability to burn off fat. Boy, these women, they drop off weight. But I got to tell you, this excessive use of diet pills and dieting causes problems with a metabolic rate. Uh, almost the majority of my customers who lost all their weight, they put it all back on and more after they do the fentramine and the low calorie diets. Don't do it. There are other diets that we can do as far as um, weight control are concerned when you have hypothyroid. Um, pituitary deficiencies, and believe it or not, underactive thyroids are pretty hereditary. 
And if mama is iodine deficient or has thyroid problems at the time of pregnancy, we could have some real interesting problems with baby uh, later on in life, not just including thyroid issues, but actually growth and a whole bunch of brain activity issues. Thyroid and the proper function of it is so important. I can't over-exaggerate that at all. I think one of the biggest reasons why we're seeing so much thyroid problems is because of all the chemicals in the environment. And that includes, it includes flame retardants, chemical sprays that we use like on our couches to keep things from staining, pesticides. There's some brand new studies um, that are out regarding those retardants and how they actually can shut down thyroid function or slow it substantially. But chemical pesticides, once again, they're estrogen mimickers, but they're very strong estrogen mimickers that can block thyroid receptors. All these chemicals, um, including the list that you can see here, can all contribute. And we're seeing an unbelievable amount, particularly in perimenopausal women, of thyroid issues like I've never seen before. Symptoms, oh man. I can tell you the tests that they do are very, very unreliable. Um, we'll go through and, and hopefully you can copy down the proper test that can increase your rate. The standard TSH test, which reg re registers thyroid stimulating hormone, is only about 25% accurate. We can raise it to about 50% levels if we include some of the other things that I'll mention here. Um, in our fitness section, we'll go through the body temperature test which is probably one of the best ways to determine if you have an underactive thyroid. Other symptoms, however, include fatigue, depression, apathy, lethargy, lethargic. You know, you just don't feel like doing anything. Weight gain, bloating, menstrual problems. I, I have a lot of young girls that have thyroid issues that are coming to me, and they're not cycling because their estrogen dominance and their thyroid issues, they're not cycling. Sensitivity to cold and heat. They get very cold very, very, very fast. Hair loss, dry skin, the nails start peeling, the low libido, infertility, insomnia. Look at all this. Just from not having a property, proper amount of thyroid hormones flowing through the body. Slow healing, carpal tunnel syndrome, lowered immune, infections, dry eye. I mean, we have tons of prescription drugs that treat these individual problems. But I gotta tell you, some tests need to be run. I'm gonna jump here a little bit to the testing because I, I think it's kind of important that you recognize if we're gonna have all these symptoms, this is the test that you need to have performed. And you be very specific, very specific, because most doctors will only run the TSH and that is totally inadequate. So, TSH, free T4, free T3, reverse T3, and they need to do the additional antibody tests to confirm whether or not you have Hashimoto's disease. Because your TSH will come out normal, and they'll say, oh, you're no problem, but you'll have Hashimoto's disease. So we need these full panel testings done. And I'll tell you, if you need any of these, there'll be any, uh, in any of the vitamin herb stores. We can give you a copy of this, and you can take it into your doc and say, this is what I want. This is what the research is supporting that physicians should conduct when they do thyroid testing. Vitamin mineral analysis. Take a look. Are you missing those nutrients that I mentioned? Are you full of toxic metals? Do some hormone testing, including DHEA, estrogens, progesterone. The list is on here. Your insulin. Liver enzymes. Do you realize if you're iron deficient, which a good portion of American women are, uh, especially if they're having all this heavy cycling because they're <laughs> obviously not having adequate amounts of progesterone and they're estrogen dominant, that too can contribute to thyroid issues. So it's important you get that little finger prick and find out if you're iron deficient and take care of iron with a whole food source iron. When we're talking about diet, if you have an underactive thyroid, ah, iodine rich foods, including sea vegetables, yummy, yummy. I know a lot of people going, gag me. But I'm gonna tell you right now, this really does aid and abed the uptake of iodine, kelp, Nori, dulce, kombucha. We have, I know in our store, these little packets are like 75 cents, and my, my 11 year old eats them like crazy. And what they are is they're sea vegetables. They taste yummy, but they're very rich. Sea salt that's iodized is one of the best ways to get it. And we still require right about 2,000 to 2,200 milligrams of sodium per day. So 
Anything in excess of that's not good. But I've got to tell you, going on a super low sodium diet, I know we're concerned about blood pressure and other issues, but you've got to have some sources of sodium, and sea salt is also a rich way to get it if it's iodized. Eating um, essential fatty acids, walnuts, almonds, pecans, pumpkin seeds, those essential fatty acids help with hormonal stabilization. Now, there's a certain class of vegetables that you shouldn't eat, if you have a thyroid issue, that you shouldn't eat a lot of if you have an underactive thyroid. Now, if your thyroid is overactive, you want to include these in your diet. <laughs> so, and now mind you, when they're cooked, it neutralizes certain um, the, the effects of them that can slow the thyroid. But uncooked, kale, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, soy, Brussels sprouts, um, those are all things if you have an underactive thyroid, you should avoid raw. Avoid tap water with chlorine, fluoride, which inhibit, inhibits iodine absorption. Get some good water filtration on your drinking water. You know, a reverse osmosis system is a wonderful under the sink type of system that can help hopefully filter out most of those and some of the particulates as well. High fiber diet to speed up the elimination, to get rid of all these metabolites, the estrogen metabolites, the chemicals, all the stuff that we're taking in. I think I mentioned to you that they estimate that we now in our society get as much toxins exposure or toxics exposure in one day that our grandparents got in 25 years. So, because of all the chemicals, and our government continues to ignore and find other priorities other than its people's health. Uh, drinking lots of water every two hours. Once again, you're detoxing your body. Once again, clean, clean water. There are quite a few supplements that can aid and abed your ability to deal with thyroid, particularly when it's borderline under active thyroid, which we see a lot of. And we'll go through the basal uh, temperature test later. But when you're borderline, even with a broad spectrum testing that uh, is recommended, your doc's not going to give you the standard medications, which in should include a T4 and T3 and adjusted every six months. Oftentimes, physicians are just giving a T4, and over a period of time, the body, because they're not checking, the body won't be able to convert T3 any longer, because what they're hoping is a good thyroid will convert that T4 into T3, and extended usage does not uh, allow for that. Automidine iodine, or kelp sources of iodine, can be used to help feed the thyroid. But once again, you need to have other nutrients, including a good multiple vitamin, vitamin A, in other words, beta carotene sources ain't going to cut it. And I know a lot of people, doctors panic when they see, oh my God, she's recommending vitamin A. You have to take very high dosages over a long period of time. But if you're getting a lot of infections, that's a really good indicator that you're not getting adequate amounts of vitamin A. Uh, vitamin E, 400 to, to uh, 1200. Once again, 95% absorption reduction when you're deficient in vitamin E. Very important. Once again, a good absorbable multivitamin will cover the majority of people on that with a minimum of about 100 to 120 IUs of a natural vitamin E. Not a synthetic that you're going to find in your typical grocery store vitamin. Um, ester C is important for iron. Most mineral uptakes, it's important. And if you don't like the nuts, there's some omega-369 fatty acids that you can take in liquid-wise or pill-wise that can reduce uh, inflammatory as well caused by some of the symptoms, but help ad in addition with hormonal stabilization. There are glandulars. Um, oftentimes, um, I'll have uh, customers will come in and they'll grab the kelp and they'll read about glandulars. Glandulars can be very supportive. They're kind of like doing like a, 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 a mini um, support that can help feed, it's like feeding the thyroid to help induce it to function in a more proper way. There are thyroid action as well, L-tyrosine. That's an amino acid and if you're deficient in L-tyrosine and there are tests your doctor can do, um, your body won't uptake uh, iodine as well. So many little nuances and most of it stems with not eating a good diet and, and then obviously not eating a good organic diet because the foods aren't too nutritionally there anymore when you're buying it from a standard grocery store. 
Uh, Google, Google Sterone Stimulate. There's a really cool combination, I know I have at my store that you can get, but that adds the kelp with some homeopathics that can help the body work with itself to stimulate you know, the action of the thyroid, particularly the conversion of T4 into T3 for weight loss. Homeopathics cause no harm and they can be taken with other medications. Very helpful, been around for a very long time. Um, mineral deficiencies, so if you have a good multiple vitamin that is absorbing well, you're going to have some zinc and you're going to have some copper in there. And remember we've talked about prostate and other issues. Ah, see, when you're mineral deficient, it causes a lot of problems. So vitamins, minerals, a few added things in there to help support the thyroid, avoiding a few different types of uh, thyroid slowing foods. We can work on a borderline underactive thyroid. Next, we're going to be moving on to the uh, fitness portion of our show. I want to review with you a really good test, actually, that's more effective than blood work, but it, in combination with, uh, with your symptoms, can really help you help your doctor along. We'll be moving on to the fitness portion of our show. Thank you very much. Hi, welcome to the fitness portion of our show. And as promised, I'm going to review something called the Barnes Home Test. Now, how this fits in to fitness is that if your thyroid is underactive, you will gain weight. And so, in order to help figure out whether or not thyroid may be a contributing factor to your inability to lose weight, there's this wonderful little test that's been around for a very long time that we can conduct. All right, you hit your, your alarm goes off, smack, you put the thermometer under your arm. And particularly either a digital thermometer or one of the old-fashioned kind of thermometers is best. We're not talking about forehead. We're not talking about mouth. We're talking about putting it and getting it in there pretty deep under the arm. If you have a regular thermometer, you're going to want to leave that there for about 6 to 10 minutes. And just kind of, you know, you're hitting the snooze alarm. About the time the snooze alarm goes off 10 minutes later, you take it out. And for 3 to 5 mornings in a row, you're going to track that body temperature. Now, if your body temperature runs 97.8 or above 97, chances are good you're borderline underactive thyroid. You may not show up in any test, but nonetheless, if you're below 97.8, you should go in and get that full spectrum, full panel testing that I mentioned earlier. Um, if you come out just kind of on the low end of normal, we can supplement and do some other things to help stimulate thyroid output. But that basal test, you take it into your doc along with the symptoms, and then hopefully maybe working with your doc, a good health practitioner, we can help you lose some weight. Thank you very much. Next, we're going to be moving on to the research portion of our show. Thank you. Welcome to the research portion of our show, and with us today is our researcher, Ralph Turciano. Thank you for the intro. Well, good news, potentially good news for hepatitis C sufferers. Consider that most, or I should say about 50% of the population does not respond to normal treatments for hepatitis C. Well, what was discovered recently, and this is going to appear in the Journal of Hepatology. So again, this is not like a, a flaky publication or think that where scientific method is not taken seriously. What they discovered was something very interesting about a very simple, natural, non-toxic compound. A compound that's normally found in many of your natural plants, but you should be consuming in your diet anyways. This compound is known as quercetin. What they discovered was this. They couldn't find out why or how hepatitis C and the viruses keep re reproducing in the liver until they discovered two heat shock proteins, particularly two precise ones, heat shock protein 40 and heat shock protein number 70. They discovered that quercetin inhibited the production of these proteins, which in turn prevented the virus from reproducing itself. 
And this is what they said, quote unquote, since cursing has been shown to inhibit hepatitis C infection, French said, who's a doctor, a phase one clinical trial will soon begin in UCLA. And there are words, Kirsten is a plant-derived bioflavonoid is used by some people as a nutritional supplement. Obviously, if you suffer from allergies, chances you probably may be using Kirsten already. Laboratory to show, test show, it may have an anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties and is being investigated for a wide range of potential health benefits. Currently, the early stage clinical trials tested for Kirsten for safety and efficacy against sarcoidosis, asthma, glucose absorption, and diabetes and obesity and in diabetes. But because quercetin targets cellular, cellular proteins rather than viral proteins, there is less likelihood of developing a viral resistance. Proteins cannot change like viral uh, proteins can. And it said basically quercetin may allow for the dissection of the viral life cycle and has potential therapeutic use reduce virus production uh, with low associated toxicity, actually virtually no toxicity. And since 50% of the population does not respond to your typical ribavirin interferon uh, basically treatments, it holds an incredible amount of promise. And quote unquote, I'm trying to quote because it's about serious stuff, it's life and death, so I want to make sure I don't misquote the researchers. A non-toxic treatment for hepatitis C would be great because our current therapies have significant side effects and only a certain percentage of the patient population responds, which is really cool because what it's doing, it's veering away from the old philosophy, which you usually hear in pharmacology and medicine when they say the poison makes the dose. Not all medical treatments or drugs should have to be toxic to qualify for that category. Kirsten and natural bioflavonoid would be a lifesaver for at least up to 200 to 300 million people which currently have hepatitis C infection and the half out here that don't respond in the United States to normal treatments. Now, another natural compound, pine bark, often sometimes known as pycnogenol. And this is for people with a very uncomfortable subject called hemorrhoids. And I normally wouldn't bring it up, but the response on pine bark or pycnogenol was phenomenal. What they did was this, and this was at the Anzio University in Italy. They investigated 84 patients suffering from acute hemorrhoids, the type where it bleeds, where you can't move and you can't do anything. And what they discovered is since pycnogenol has antioxidant properties, anti-inflammatory and anti-thrombotic properties, that it may be beneficial in the case of hemorrhoids. So they're thinking for acute and chronic treatments. So they took three groups. They took one treatment group, gave them 300 milligrams of pine bark or pycnogenol per day. The second group, they gave pine bark and pine bark cream. The third group, they gave a placebo. Well, guess what happened? The complication of hemorrhoidal bleeding was completely absent in all the pycnogenol groups, the ones using the cream, one's taking the capsule. The placebo group still had bleeding two weeks after. So that was good, a good controlled study. So obviously even though the placebo group would want the bleeding to go away from a psychosomatic standpoint, it wasn't happening. Pine bark definitely had efficacy in regards to that. And quote unquote from them, they said our study suggests that pycnogenol or pine bark may help with all major symptoms. Further studies with pycnogenol are in progressive investigative preventative effects of new attacks in general management of hemorrhoids. Hey, if you've got hemorrhoids, it's not toxic, it's not harmful, fairly inexpensive, and allows you to operate throughout the day, start looking at the pine bark of pycnogenol. Otherwise, your pain is your responsibility. Another one, again, a probiotic they discovered for inflammatory bowel disease. Currently, the medications don't work well for this one either. Well, this one, they couldn't quite find out when they were giving people what they call probiotics or acidophilus for inflammatory bowel disease, why it was not working well in all cases. In some cases it would, in some cases it wouldn't. Then in certain cases they would give them lactic acid and inflammatory bowel disease would get better, but not really significantly better. Well, I discovered this. What the lactic acid was doing when it was beneficial is it was feeding and encouraging the growth of certain other beneficial bacteria or probiotics in the gut which produce something called butyric acid. 
Now, butyric acid was really common around the time of your grandparents, the 40s and 50s and 60s, the time when butter was not homogenized, it was not pasteurized, and buttermilk was often used for things like stomach upset and ulcerations. Why? Because it had incredible amounts of butyric acid. What does butyric acid do? Well, when they're looking for people with inflammatory bowel disease, they discovered they were incredibly low in butyric acid. Incredibly low. How does that create a problem? Butyric acid is responsible for controlling inflammation in the gut. So when butyric acid levels were low, inflammation skyrocketed. Henceforth, inflammatory bowel disease. They said, quote unquote, butyric acid has well-known anti-inflammatory effects and able to strengthen intestinal wall cells, making it the ideal agent against IBD. So now we realize that lactic acid is used for growth by certain back population bacteria that produce butyric acid, which could explain why some of the older studies had a positive outcome. Recent trials focusing just on butyric acid, producing bacterial strains have been extremely promising, can lead to an entirely new treatment for IBD. So as, uh, basically, as butyric acid producing bacteria are naturally depleted in IBD patients, we need to identify strains that help colonize the gut and basically recommend those to our patients. And this is within the Journal of Medical Microbiology, another well understood publication. So just not being made up or anecdotal. All right, outside of that, I'm going to go in the attack phase with Monsanto. We only have about two minutes left, so I want to make sure I specify what's going on here. Basically, in the International Journal of Biological Sciences, a very well known journal, they did a study in regards to Monsanto's data in effect to genetically modified maize or corn. They said, quote unquote, Monsanto gathered its own crude statistical data after conducting a 90 day study, even though chronic problems can rarely be found after 90 days. Real short study, even though studies of problems are found after that. And concluded that corn was safe for human consumption. Your child's consumption your consumption, everyone else around your consumption. The stamp of approval may have been premature. What they did is they found that the genetically modified corn interfered with the detoxification effect of many of the organs, heart, adrenal, spleen, blood cells, everything across those lines. They just basically concluded it had hepatorenal toxicity. Genetically modified corn, corn syrup, everything. The substances have never been part of an integral part of the human and animal diet and their health consequences for those who consume them. Consume them. Monsanto said the study that was found that products were poisonous was faulty. Henceforth, the journal came back and said they don't know where Monsanto is coming from in this. This is a very mysterious mistake because Monsanto is leaving some data out. Well, Monsanto said this in the New York Times. Monsanto should not have to vouch for the safety of biotech foods. Our interest is in selling as much of it as possible. It's the FDA's job. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ralph. Thank you very much for joining our show. Do your research. Thanks again.